Uh, I want to ask about Keegan Jones, obviously been very effective uh, yeah, in what he he's been doing. Um, is that one of those things where, you know, somebody would look at it and say, oh, you know, why don't you use him more? But then the flip side would be, well, maybe he's effective because he's used in select situations. Maybe. I think it's a combination of both. You know, uh, he's, when you use receivers sometimes as running backs, it's a little bit change of pace for defenses and how to defend you. You know, a lot of times we're motioning him into the backfield, forming a two-back set. Um, you know, he's he's been productive. But it's we've also had a lot of production out of our running backs also. So it's not like... Okay, we're not getting production out of running back. Why don't we move him back to running back? Is that you're just trying to utilize him in a lot of different roles? Kaz did that before for us. You know, we got a lot of production out of Kaz being a receiver, uh, but also using him. You know, the, you go specifically to the Arizona State game uh, last year when when Zach was down and we we ran some receiver type run plays, and, and Kaz was really effective doing that. So, um, you know, to have someone that is a multi-tool player like Keegan is is a it's tough for a defense to defend because you got to kind of figure out where he is. You know, some of it was him catching the ball. Um, some of it is him be, coming back in the backfield and being a running back. So, um, you know, we hope when we get with the opportunity, we can expand his role as we continue to move forward. Another thing that was very successful, obviously, was the Schleep packages. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, his status uh, a little bit. Is he, is he unavailable again today? He's unavailable today. Okay. Um, uh, even if he's not available, would, is that something you would look at with one of the other quarterbacks? Maybe mixing yeah, that in. Yeah, we do have we do have the ability with other guys to do what Colin did. Um, you know, and we just depending on who we're playing and what's going on is is how, what part of, how much part of the game plan that is. You know, we felt like it was something that was we could run against um, Oregon State last week, and Colin was really successful doing it. So, uh, but that's always there's a lot of offense. And then what we do on a weekly basis is how much can we carry on a weekly basis? Because what can you practice? You know, you can run a lot of things, and then you're not really good at anything because you only run one play, each play once during the week, and you're running a million plays. So, you know, that's the fine line when you're game planning of what packages are going to be effective versus the defense and the personnel that the other school deploys. Um, and then practice time. You know, how do you how do you get it all in? You know, because there's always a, there's a ton of good ideas. Um, but how do you practice it all? You know, and I think being specific with it. So, um, but we do have the ability. You know, we have some other quarterbacks that that are that are runners that, that, that have the ability to run that run over 20 miles an hour like Conlon does. Um, so those guys have been practicing that. And it's been something we've been doing for a while here. It just depends on what game and who we're playing. Whether we're gonna, it's gonna be part of the package that week. Uh, when you are game planning for a team, how much, um, if at all, do you use kind of statistical analysis when you're getting we into use the game all plan? Of it. So, I mean, there's a ton of statistical analysis. You know, third down, what is their blitz percentage on third down? How much man are you getting? How much cover two are you getting? How much cover three are you getting? That's all. We've always used statistics in that because you go into a third down package and don't have a lot of man routes and they play 90% man, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So, um, there's a ton of that that goes into it goes into it in terms of analyzing your opponents. When you're starting a game plan for a particular opponent, does it start with some sort of like cheat sheet about them or do you just turn on the tape? No, we, we've got every game that we they've played this year and if the coordinator's been there last year right. and, or maybe if the coordinator was at another school, all those games are broken down. So we have all that information at our hands so we can tell you their tendencies on first and second down. We can tell you their tendencies on second and long. We can tell you their tendencies on second and long on the left hash in the coming out area. We have all that information available to us, and that's already done. And then we have a sequential way of how we look at it. What are our first and second down plays? What are our openers? What's third down look like? And then how do we break third down down? Is it third and short, third and medium, third and long, third and extra long? What's the red zone look like? What does the coming out area look like? So those are all broken down in, in the categories. And then each coach on our staff has a specific area that is really their area of expertise. So they kind of will present. Sorry, we're going to talk about third down. And then Coach Gandhi will give the third down presentation. Looking at the uh, snap counts the last two games now, um, it looks like the offensive lines have been kind of tightened up the last two games. Um, is there anything specific that's contributed to that? Or? It's just how Drev deploys those guys. You know, we meet during every Saturday if it's a night game or every Friday if it's an early morning Saturday game and then go over the depth of what's in it. You know, first off, who's available? And again, we don't do that till the end of the week because mm -hmm. you never know who's available. You know, stranger things have happened. You know, towards the end of the week where you say, hey, this is going to happen, and then all of a sudden you get to Friday and say, hey, he's out. Okay, well, what's our plan? So when we sit down and we talk about team, who we're playing, who's playing well, what their practice was like that week, all those other things are all factors in the game. You know,
you see any similarities between um, Dante's freshman year and Dorian's freshman year? Just the, you know, growing through tough times. Yeah, I hadn't, stuff. I hadn't really thought about that. I'm not a big comparison guy, so I, I, I that's a good question, but I don't, I never, I didn't even think of that, to be honest with you, so I couldn't, I couldn't say yay or nay. Um, I think it's, the reason I don't is it's apples and oranges, is what's around them, where are you, all that other stuff, you know what I mean? It's, um, I think Dorian kind of got thrown into the mix, um, rose to number two during camp, um, and then Wilton was our starter, but then Wilton got hurt in the second quarter, hurt his back, which was a, he had a lingering back deal, and so Dorian kind of got thrown into the mix, you know, as at, at that point in time. Dorian wasn't here for the spring, um, so really we had Dorian for three weeks in August, and then we were playing a game, so I think that was a little bit different. Obviously, Dante was in early and early in January, um, but I hadn't thought about that to be honest with you. Does, does uh, Dante, having played a lot more than Dorian in high school, help him as a freshman? I think I think he's got more experience. You know, that was the one thing with Dorian. That's the one thing that's that that I we loved about Dorian was that he, he hadn't had a ton of reps. So he was a receiver as a junior, and then his senior year they were so good. He only played really in the first half of most games, so he had a limited um, he had limited exposure. So you, there was we always knew there was that huge upside for him. Um, but you, the one thing you loved about him was his competitive nature and. And his his will to win and all those other things. So you know he had a, he had a great combination there. So, um, but a lot of quarterbacks that play early, like the Trevor Lawrence's of the world, if you study, uh, Matt Barkley is another guy that comes to mind. Is they had a ton of reps in high school. You know it's really rare that someone that didn't play very much in high school, for whatever the circumstances are, that's going to commit and, and play as a true freshman. Um, you know I coached Marcus at, at Oregon, and he was a kid that didn't play much during his junior year, then had an unbelievable senior year in Hawaii. But when he came in, the, we were fortunate enough that we redshirted him for a year. So his first start was as a redshirt freshman. Um, you know, Dorian and Dante kind of get thrown in the mix. But when you talk about the Trevor Lawrence's and the Matt Barkley's, I think Matt played four years. Of, not a bad, I know Trevor Lawrence played four years of high school football. They had a ton of reps and a ton of experience. And, and for that position, the amount of snaps that you can get live um, are huge because practice is totally different than the game. You know, quarterbacks are not hit in practice anywhere, whether it's yeah. high school, college professionals, whatever, so playing quarterback is a different deal practice-wise uh, than any other position, so you know, those live reps are, are, are very invaluable. Uh, I know the other day you referenced uh, their receiver's big performance against uh, Colorado. Just from a matchup standpoint, what, what does he uh, bring? Uh, he's he's a really, he's good size. Um, and, you know, it was really a, a breakout game for him, but I, I think the, the, his ability to run after the catch, you know, not every ball was thrown deep. You know, like the one coming out, I think he caught a slant coming out on the three-yard line, and that turned into a 97 or 90, whatever yard, uh, on touchdown where he ran away from some people, but he also made some people miss. Um, so his ability to, to, to run after the catch, obviously we got to make sure that we're really sure in our tackling, sure in where we are from a leverage standpoint. You know, we have people on, on all sides of them because – it looks like sometimes in, in some of the things that happened in Colorado game, one guy didn't get him down. Um, and because one guy didn't get him down, you got to make sure you got a lot of guys running to the ball. But we, I mean, that was a, a performance for the ages. I mean, it's, I mean and I, I think it almost all came in the second half. So there was 250 plus in the second half of the college football game. That's, that's pretty impressive. For Stanford's defense obviously had to hold them down after being down 29 did. nothing. What did they do better at, from that point forward? Um, I think as you watch Stanford's defense play, um, I just think they've grown from the Hawaii game to the Colorado, Colorado game, and you continue to see constant improvement in those guys. As I think the better they understand uh, Coach April's uh, scheme, um, the, the better they're playing. I think they're, they're playing a little bit more comfortable. I think they're playing with a little bit more confidence now. they got some really talented athletes on that side of the ball. That can cause some problems for you, but I think they're, the continuity of that defense from the first game of the year to the sixth game of the year has, has been really impressive. And even the continuity of that defense from the first half of that game to the second half of that game, you know. And, and again, um, Colorado made some plays in the first half. You know, that, that receiver for Colorado caught the shallow. Travis caught the shallow, and you know, 
and made a guy miss. He's a, he's a really special player. Um, and you got to kind of tip your cap to him. It wasn't like that was an unsound defense that Stanford was in. It was a really good play by the wideout. Shador's a really, really talented quarterback, one of the most talented quarterbacks in the country. So, um, you know, but to see them grow, even over the course of that game, was impressive to watch. As a favorite team born into Pac-12 after dark, do you... <laughs> Pac-12 after dark means wackiness and anything can happen. Um, we don't pay attention to that. Pac-12 after dark means Pac-12 after my bedtime, so <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing that stands for for us. But we don't. We've never talked about favorite, un, not favorite, underdog. That you know, we we, we approach every opponent with a, a ton of respect and defend their schemes and defend their personnel and the other stuff. I've never, and I, and I don't know many coaches that ever talk about that part of it. Who's favorite? Who's not favorite? You know, sometimes they'll tell us during the week, like, "Hey, this is the point spread." Like, really? I wouldn't have been the points where I thought the game should have been, you know. There's some games, and I've been in games, where you think, we're going to blow these guys out, and it's a dogfight. And then there's other games where, like, wow, this is going to be a really close game, and it's a blowout. So, you know, no one no one can predict what the outcomes of any of these things are going to be. So it's, you know, I think if you can focus on the process and not worry about the things that you don't control, we don't control what Vegas sets it at. You know, and a lot of times Vegas sets it because they want to get even money on both sides. That doesn't mean that they think this team is that many points better than that team. They just think if the money lines here, half's going to go here, half's going to go here, and then the house wins. So, um, I don't really have any much more than that. This so. will probably be one of your last 730 games, but going to the Big Ten, uh, the assumption is most likely those start times are going to move up, right? So, and I know you, 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 you don't <laughs> like sitting around until 730, right? No, so you're, no you're happy I, about that. I don't know anybody that does. <laughs> Do you guys? No. no. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. I don't know anybody who does, except for the people that sell commercials. <laughs> but it is what it is. I mean, it's part of the deal. And again, like when we talk about focusing on the process and not focus on things we don't control, is just tell us when we're playing and, and, and we're going to be there. Um, we like playing at times when it's convenient. You know, I think it's especially for fans. You know, and I think sometimes in this TV deal, and I, we all understand it, and it drives the business, and people all get paid, and I, I get all that, but. I think sometimes we forget about the local fans, you know, the people that actually want to go to the game. And I want to bring my kid to a football game where it starts at 8 o'clock at night and it's going to get over at midnight. Well, I don't know if I can bring my kid to that game. You know, that's that's what I, I worry about, that that, that part of it, and, and the fans that have to, to go, okay, what time is this game? I and mean, you can't plan it because every week you don't know when you're going to play. That part makes it difficult. But there's no crying on the yacht, so we're not going to cry about that. We're just we're just going to get ready to go play a game against 730. And it's a good Stanford team that's, Coming off a really huge victory last week against Colorado. So. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks,